A few months ago, I was contacted by a German company called Flypers, who wanted to know if I'd be interested in reviewing their new aircraft. It was called a Purs 75, and it certainly looked cool and very unique, but it was their impressive claim that it could fly at speeds in excess of 280 kph that really got my interest. So as they were willing to send me one out for free, I of course said yes, and after a couple of weeks of patiently waiting, this is what I received. The box was good quality and sturdy, and inside I found the aircraft neatly packaged along with two bundles of accessories. One bundle contained a bungee cord that is necessary to get the aircraft in the air, and the other bundle contained a few 3D printed parts, a few metal pieces, some screws and some propellers. The aircraft itself was in two parts. There was a single piece wing and then a fuselage. Both parts were made from material called glass reinforced plastic, which is essentially just fiberglass with a plastic coating. Taking a close look at the aircraft, you see that in the nose of the fuselage there is a hole for a FPV camera, and at the other end of the fuselage there is an opening for installing the motor mount. The tail, with this unusual pod in the top, is hollow and is designed to house the FPV antenna. These holes along the sides are then for inserting screws to secure the camera and flight controller mounts, and this opening in the bottom is where you connect the bungee hook. The wing is an interested and complicated shape that has clearly been designed with speed and performance in mind. Not only does it have a swept back profile, it also has anhedral tips, which are both features often seen on fast fighter jets. Rather uniquely, this wing is also designed to house internal servo linkages, which is something I've never seen before, but is obviously done to reduce drag and increase efficiency. Unlike the fuselage, the wing is built around a wooden frame and also includes some carbon spars for rigidity. It's still mostly hollow though, which is useful as it allows you to route the servo wires down through this opening here, where they can then be fed into the fuselage. Ultimately, it's a very cool looking aircraft, but I'm not going to lie to you, when it came to building it, it certainly wasn't easy. There's a limited amount of space in the fuselage with minimal access, and the installation of the servos and linkages in the wings was especially fiddly and, to be honest, downright infuriating. That said though, through much anger and swearing, I did manage to do it, and this is how. I started off by taking the Matek F411 wing flight controller, and onto it I soldered pin headers so that external components such as servos or GPS could easily be attached later without having to do fiddly soldering. I then took a Cloud Phoenix 50 amp ESC and soldered that to the board, before then soldering in place a XC60 lead with a length of around 10cm. I then took a iFlight XC 2306 2450kV motor and snipped off about 8cm from each wire before then soldering them to the ESC like this. The flight controller was then installed in the fuselage here with double sided tape and the ESC was carefully pushed down towards the rear. The XC60 lead was then bent forwards to face towards the nose and the motor wires from the ESC were then fed at the back where they were then resoldered to the motor like this. The motor was then bolted to this metal mount, which was then installed in the rear of the fuselage like this, and secured with two screws. With that done, I then set about installing the video transmitter, which was a TBS Unified Pro Race 2. Onto it, I soldered a short servo extension lead like this, and then I attached a TBF Triumph Pro antenna. Now, as specified in the PERS manual, the video transmitter and antenna are designed to go into the tail like this, but to do that, you first need to cut a hole. Now I tried doing this carefully with a knife, but annoyingly found that the GRP skin of the aircraft cracks and fractures when pressure is applied to it, which prevents you from cutting it cleanly. Eventually though, I did manage to create a suitably sized opening, which then allowed me to insert the video transmitter around the antenna. This wasn't easy to do, as access was very restricted, and it took some time before I was able to get the wires correctly routed into the fuselage, so they could then be plugged into the flight controller. Once I did manage to get the VTX installed, I then moved on to installing the FPV camera. This was a Runcam Phoenix 2, and the first thing I did was extend the wiring to a suitable length with a short servo extension lead. The camera was then installed in this 3D printed mount, and also installed in the mount was this small metal bracket. With some difficulty, the mount was then installed in the nose of the fuselage, where it was then secured with four screws. The wires from the camera were then routed down through the inside of the fuselage like this, before then being plugged into the flight controller. With that done, I then installed the GPS unit, which was Midtech MAQ5AA3. Using some lengths of wire, I extended the stock wires by a few centimetres, before then adding a 4 pin pump connector to the end. The unit was then installed in the front of the fuselage here with a piece of double sided tape, 
and the wire was written alongside the camera wire up to the flight controller, where it was then plugged into place. After that was done, the only thing left to do on the fuselage was install the receiver, which was a TPS Crossfire Nano. I started off by soldering on the included wires and then attached a 4-pin pond connector to the end, before then plugging the wires into the flight controller. I then secured the receiver to the inside of the fuselage like this with some double-sided tape, before then routing the antenna through this hole and down to the tail, where it was then lazily secured in place like this with some clear tape. Now at this point, the only thing left to do to complete the build was to install the servos and the linkages in the wing, which in principle should have been a fairly quick and easy task, but in reality turned out to be anything but. The first problem was that the servo housings were designed for a very specific yet obscure brand of servo. So the Emacs ESOA MD2 servos I bought specifically for this aircraft did not immediately fit. Thankfully I was able to remedy this by cutting off these tabs and then by cutting away some of the wood in the servo housing. But doing this without damaging the GRP skin of the wing itself proved to be almost impossible. Once the servos were installed though, I then found myself with the infuriating challenge of getting the wires routed down through the inside of the wing and out through the access hole in the middle. Despite the fact that the wing is hollow, the wires persistently got snagged somewhere along the way, and it was only after many many attempts and the eventual use of a tethered hook that I eventually had some success. Now with that done, the next task was to make some linkages and then install them between the servos and the elevons. But this turned out to be a job that required free hands and a surgeon's dexterity. Making the linkages themselves wasn't too tricky. All I had to do was take the steel rod that came in the Paris kit, cut off some lengths about 25mm long and then bend them into shape something like this. The challenge though was getting them installed. After connecting one end to the elevon horn, it was then extremely fiddly getting the other end correctly connected to the servo, and it took a lot of trial and error before I eventually managed to do it. Once that was done though, completing the wings was then just a simple case of screwing on the servo colours. This was easy enough to do, although in case you hadn't noticed, you do need to trim down the servo horns quite significantly so that they will then fit. Now with the physical build complete, all that was left to do at this point was the programming. Now I won't go into a lot of detail about this, as this was mostly straightforward, but I will pop a copy of the CLI dump in the comments for those of you that are interested. One thing that I will mention though is that the midpoints of the servos needed to be software adjusted to set the correct reflex. This was done with the assistance of this 3D printed tool that comes in the PERS kit, and also with the assistance of this graphic that's seen in the PERS manual. After the programming was complete, all that was left to do to get the aircraft flight ready was then to attach a prop and stick some velcro in the battery compartment, and I also popped a bit of tape over the solar tail pod here, as directed in the manual. In the field, assembling the aircraft was a simple case of installing a battery, connecting the server leads to the flight controller, and then bolting on the wing. The battery I used was this Tatsu R-Line 1550 4S pack, which I found perfectly balanced to CG when stuffed into the front of the nose. With it installed, the aircraft weighed around 450 grams, which is below the maximum takeoff weight as described in the manual. Now, to launch the aircraft, you have to use this bungee which comes in the PERS kit. This is apparently essential as the aircraft needs quite a bit of speed behind it to be able to get into the air. The theory is you pull the bungee back, attach the aircraft to the hook, let it go, and then as it starts to climb, hammer the throttle. Unfortunately though, when attempting my first launch, the bungee didn't disconnect as it should, and instead pulled the aircraft into the ground at speed. This is where the fragility of glass reinforced plastic became apparent, as the crash smashed the nose of the aircraft into multiple pieces. Now obviously this was extremely disappointing, as after just one flight attempt, the aircraft was heavily damaged without ever leaving the ground. But not content with giving up immediately, I grabbed all the pieces, and then with some hot glue and some tape, clumsily reassembled the nose the best I could. I then went out for a second attempt, but having had the bungee fail to work the first time, opted this time to go for a hand launch instead. Surprisingly, this actually worked, although I feel this is probably due more to luck than it was to any degree of skill. Regardless though, the aircraft did manage to take to the air, and once it was up, I found it flew very well. Now unfortunately, for some reason the VTX was set to just 25 milliwatts, so I had to contend with a poor FPV picture for much of the flight. That did mean I was somewhat restricted to flying in small and tight circles, but I was still able to get a bit of a feel for how the aircraft handled and what sort of speeds it was capable of. It certainly felt very agile and responsive, but at the same time still felt surprisingly locked in and stable. 
Despite the fact that it was a windy day and that the aircraft is quite small, it slides through the air like a hot knife through butter and was actually very easy to fly. In terms of speed, it was certainly pretty fast. With the exception of launch, the speed never dropped below 100 kph, and on average, it was around 150. Obviously, what you want to know though is what was the maximum speed I was able to achieve, and the answer to that is 240. Now, clearly, this is a little bit below the top speed that Flypers had advertised, but considering the shameful repair job I'd done on the nose, which was undoubtedly producing a lot of drag, I think this speed was still impressive. I reckon, given more time and maybe being able to get the pairs to fly faster, but all that fast flying quickly saw the battery depleted, and I soon found that I had to land. Now unfortunately, when it came to landing, things went a little bit wrong. Just as I was lining the aircraft up for approach, the FPV picture briefly disappeared, and despite my best efforts to continue to fly blind for a moment, I instead inevitably ended up crashing it into the ground. Not surprisingly, this caused the already damaged nose to get further smashed to pieces. But to make things worse, one of the wingtips was also cleanly ripped off, and the tail pod, which was already slightly damaged from the VTX installation, was sheared off as well. Now, as I have no experience in repairing fiberglass, and the wooden frame inside the wing was also severely damaged, I was left with little choice at this point but to clear the aircraft to ride off, and ended up going home feeling pretty bitter. The story doesn't end there though. Flypers were so keen to prove to me that the pirates could indeed reach speeds of 280 kph that they offered to send me another one. Admittedly, I was initially reluctant to say yes, as my experience with the aircraft had so far been frustrating. But with a little bit of persuasion, I did eventually agree, and with that they promptly got a replacement shipped out. When it arrived, I built it up essentially the same way that I built the first. The only difference was that I relocated the VTX and the antenna to here, simply because it was easier and also so that I could avoid damaging the tail during its installation. Now annoyingly, just after completing the build, whilst doing some testing on the bench, one of the Elevon horns broke, and it was at this point I discovered that they are only 3D printed. To me, this seemed like a questionable material from which to fabricate such a critical load bearing component, but on the plus side, it did mean I could easily make a replacement, and within an hour, the aircraft was again ready for flight. Back to the field I then headed, and this time, when it came to launch, I decided to again try using the bungee. This time though, I did things a little bit differently, as just before release, I pulled back on the pitch stick by about 25%, just to push the elevons up a little to help the aircraft climb. As you can see, this approach worked, as the purse was flawlessly catapulted into the air, after which I engaged the motor and began the flight. Once airborne, I was happy to see that this time around the video transmitter was correctly broadcasting at full power, which meant I could fly the aircraft further without having fear of losing the FPV picture. Just like before, the aircraft flew nicely, feeling sufficiently stable and yet extremely responsive. I reckon that in the right hands, this aircraft would be capable of some impressive acrobatic manoeuvres, though I wasn't willing to try this myself for fear of breaking the freshly replaced 3D printed Elevon horn. As you can see on this flight, I tested Return to Home, and I found that it worked well, although for some reason the loiter radius was extremely large. This wasn't really a significant issue, but it is something that could do with being tweaked in the INF programming at a later date. As with the first flight, the PERS yet again demonstrated some impressive speed capabilities. It would routinely exceed 150 kph with ease, and on several occasions broke past 200. The fastest speed I was able to achieve this time round was 274, which not only was significantly faster than my previous attempt, but was also just a whisker away from the flight PERS projection of 280. On the subsequent speed run, I attempted to beat this, but I was only able to achieve 261, after which I found the battery was thoroughly depleted, and then I had no choice but to come in and land. Now when it came to landing, speed actually became a bit of an issue. It seems that the PERS is so optimised for flying at speed that it's actually hard to get it to slow down. In the end, the aircraft touched down while still travelling at just over 100 kph, and as a result firmly embedded itself in the soft mud of my flying field. Now, impressively, there was no damage, although one of the wing bolts did manage to pop out of the fuselage. But after plucking the mud out the nose and reattaching the wing, the aircraft was as good as new and was ready to fly another day. In total, this flight lasted a little over four minutes, which isn't much for a fixed wing aircraft, but probably is to be expected considering the way that it was being flown. Now, a couple of days later, I decided to try flying the pairs again. 
Despite following the exact same launch procedure that I had successfully used on the previous flight, the aircraft failed to take to the air and instead once again got smashed to pieces. But this is where I have to address the elephant in the room, and there's no way to sugarcoat this fact. The PERS is extremely fragile. This is pretty much down to the fact that it's made from fiberglass, which isn't a material best known for its impact resistance, but other contributing factors are that its skin is really thin and that the majority of the airframe is hollow. Now I can appreciate why FlyPurs made some of these design decisions. Fiberglass is a great material for creating slick low drag airframes, and keeping the skin thickness minimal saves a lot of weight. But whilst both these points are true and no doubt contribute to the PERS ability to fly fast, the side effect is that the airframe becomes very fragile, and to me that seems like an unacceptable compromise. Now the fact that PERS breaks so easily obviously wouldn't be such an issue if it didn't keep failing to launch. But I have a feeling that the reason mine has been so stubborn to get off the ground is simply because I've built it to be too heavy. I say this because it seems that no one else who's built a PERS has had the same problems with launch that I have. But at the same time, they've also not loaded their airframes up with high enough hardware, so it's likely that their builds weigh a lot less than mine. Now I'll hold my hands up and admit that I didn't especially make any effort to build my PERS to be lightweight, but I reckon I could have probably built it to be at least 50 grams lighter if I'd used some better components. In all honesty though, with the exception of being able to see GPS speed on your OSD, I don't think this aircraft especially warrants having INAV installed in it, and you just make life easier for yourself if you build it up without. Ultimately, I think the PERS is a bit of a double-edged sword. There's some good qualities to it, and then there's some bad. The main negatives are obviously that the airframe is fragile, the installation of the hardware is somewhat tricky, and I also don't like the fact that the Elevon horns are only 3D printed. But these downsides though are counteracted by the aircraft's impressive flight performance, where it not only proved itself to be more than capable of achieving high speeds, but also demonstrated favourable characteristics such as stability and high manoeuvrability, while simultaneously somehow being easy to fly. It's therefore a bit of a conundrum, and it's hard to say definitively whether this is a good product or a bad one. At the moment, the pros and the cons pretty much balance each other out. Although I reckon that if fly pros could find a way to reinforce the airframe without compromising performance, they could tip the scales, and then you'd have a truly awesome aircraft. I hope you've enjoyed this quick review. I've tried to make it as factual and as honest as possible. I'd be interested to know what you think for the pros though, so please leave a comment down below. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Until next time, see ya.